Hello there. Welcome to Draw With Me. I am Danny Gregory, and um, I'm glad to be here with you yet again to draw, to talk, to have some fun. And um, what a fantastic little display we just saw, right? The F Fab 400, really. Um, all these great drawings that you guys did of the Beatles, putting me to shame yet again after my... Uh, I don't know, my tortured outing. This has been a week of, I don't know, the last week. Maybe the, maybe it was set off by drawing the Beatles, but I've had a lot of um, sort of deep and tortured emotional states um, this week when it came to drawing. It happens sometimes, you know, you just get your feelings are coming out, your emotions are coming out, and uh, sometimes it means good things in terms of your art, and sometimes it means that uh, things go off the rails. But I think it's always important to to throw yourself into your work and to, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, try and express yourself. So that is what I was doing, and I hope that you had a similar experience in the art that you were making this week. Hopefully joyous feelings, but um, I think art can teach us so much about ourselves and about the world around us. And that is, uh, you know, that is kind of the reason we do it, honestly, more than anything else. So um, I see we have a lot of people from all different kinds of places, from uh, India and Iran and Germany and Kansas City. Um, so thank you all for joining me, and let's do some drawing. Today's subject is going to be a book. I want you to go out and look around your house and find a book that has some meaning to you. Um, and that's what we're going to draw today. We're going to draw a book. So that will be an interesting thing to think about while we're doing it, to draw something that, I mean, it could be a book that meant a great deal to you at some point in your life. It could be a book that you're reading right now that you just started. Just a book that you have some kind of a feeling about. And, um, you know, it may or may not have an interesting cover to draw. That's a, that's a bonus, but it's not essential. Um, but I think it is, it is an interesting thing to do, to look at, your, look at books and uh, just think about your, the relationship that you have with, with the book. Um, so, yes, that is what we're going to do. So, so, Jen Cahill, I'm sorry you don't have any books. Perhaps you could draw your your phone instead. I'm sure you'll find a book somewhere. Draw the phone book. Does anybody have a phone book anymore? Phone books, remember them? Um, what else? Laura heard me on Nina's Art Summit. Yes, I was on um, part of this Art Summit thing that happened earlier this week. And I was, I think, one of the first people to talk. That was fun. It was interesting to talk to some new people, talk about art, about art making. So there's that. Um, what else? Um, Pradna, well, a phone book is an ancient document that was once highly revered in which the entire history and uh, record of a community was brought together in one single place. And everybody was given a little tiny piece of real estate. It was kind of like Facebook. If you imagine Facebook um, bound in one place. Facebook, but without comments, without discussions. Just simply the information that you actually could use, namely how to call somebody. Now, calling is something that we used to do also back in the day of yore. We used to have these devices in our homes that we would pick up. And we would push buttons or we would turn dials. And lo and behold, we would hear human voices. Human voices, which are kind of precursors to what you to texting. Um, yeah, it's the thing we used to do, talking, having conversations with people. So yes, it's, it was, you know, and it, it went back and forth both ways. It wasn't just a one-way form of, of uh, communication. So anyway, those are the days. So um, it is 
Your goat is in my garden, yes. May I have my scythe back? Those kinds of things. Anyway, so today we're going to draw, and yes, I guess you could draw your Kindle. Must you? I love my Kindle, don't get me wrong. I've tried drawing it. Yeah, not, not exactly. Not the most exciting thing in the, in the world to draw, a Kindle. But the point is really, I think, to look and think about a book. I mean, I don't know about you, but I like to read books. I read a lot of them. And some of them I read um, and I get a lot out of them. I, I really uh, absorb them and think about them and talk about them. and They come back to me. and They're books that I'll read over and over and over again. And then, um, like my wife, she has one book that she is obsessed with. She reads a lot of books, but she keeps coming back to one book. I swear she reads this book several times a year. It is a book called The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. I've read it once. Yeah, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what she sees in it, but she loves it. And she keeps coming back to it. It's her comfort book. Um, and... Sometimes when if we wake up in the middle of the night and she can't get back to sleep, I will read to her, not from House of Mirth. I've tried that, no. I read to her from um, All Creatures Great and Small by James Harriet. And I'll read her like a couple pages. She falls asleep. I'm exhausted and I fall asleep. So books are comfort. Books are milestones in your life. There's so many books that we have relationships with at different points in our lives. And so... Anyway, as I've been blathering, hopefully you have thought of a book that you want to draw. and You've got it nearby, and you're going to think about drawing it. Drawing the cover. Uh, Giselle reads To Kill a Mockingbird. That's a great book. That is, and that's, I mean, a great book is one that you can read and come back to, right? You can come back to it, and you can say, um, I'm getting something more out of it. Or you read it and you say, you know what, the first time, I remember the first time I read it. The first time I read it and now, or at various stages of my life, and how I saw different things, depending on how I age. I mean, I have that relationship with The Great Gatsby to some extent. I've probably read it eight or ten times. Similarly. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Arlene reads it once a year. Wow, okay. That's a, that's a lot to read once a year. That book is... Uh, that's a big one. So, yeah. Uh, Janice's Watership Down would put her to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, Red Truck Revival read um, Why Fish Don't Exist, which is a book that I recommended a few weeks ago. Love that book. Um, so, yeah. So, lots of there are lots of books that mean a lot to us. And um, Pull One Out. Denise Reads a Christmas Carol. That's, that's, that's a really nice one. I love to read Dickens. There's certain Dickens, I mean, like Bleak House. Bleak House is one of the most insane books I've ever read. It has it has um, spontaneous combustion in it. There's a character who spontaneously combusts, like a Stephen King thing. It just happens to happen in Dickens. Strange. Okay, so um, pull out your book. Let's read it. Not read it. Let's draw it. Let's draw it. Um, I am going to be drawing, by the way, speaking of books, I'm going to be drawing in my beautiful Hanamula Nostalgie. This is, this is sort of like the Rolls Royce of drawing paper, for me at least. I just love the feeling of this book. And uh, it's where I do my special line drawings, like things that I really want to be careful about and spend time on. I do it on this. But today I'm going to be drawing this book. Um, I just love this book, Bird by Bird by Annie Lamont. I don't know if you know this book, but uh, it doesn't have the most interesting cover, but it is nonetheless um, an incredibly important book to me. And I would say that in a lot of ways, this book is as much about drawing as it is about writing. The ideas, the lessons in it, they are about the creative process that we all go through. Um, and it is a book that, you know, 
I get something fresh out of it every time I read it. So it is a book that I am I'm just embarking on again right now. And, and Annie Lamont is just very wise and talks about a lot of things that, um, well, I'll see how much of it I can talk about while I'm drawing it. So I don't expect you to draw that, but I am looking forward to having a cavalcade of books next time we meet to show you at the beginning, to show all you all the books that you um, that you love. So this is about love in the end. This let me get this into the right position so you can see what I'm doing. Yeah, um, you know, but maybe you're not watching me at all. Maybe you're saying, you know what, I don't need to watch him do this. I can draw my own book. I mean, I mean, let's start with the shape of a book. It's not a difficult shape to deal with. It's a rectangle. You know, you could you could if you wanted to draw the side of the book. I think I'm just going to focus probably on the cover. Maybe I'll draw the book as an object. Why not? Yeah. So I'll draw it as an object. So I'll give it some dimension, indicating like how long it is. You know, I'm going to make the cover a little bit open. But um, yeah. So this book is called, as it says here, Some Instructions on Writing and Life. I love that. Writing and Life. And I think that, 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 you know, that's my feeling about drawing, the drawing and talking about, thinking about drawing, the role the drawing makes, plays in my life at least, is very much about life, not just about, you know, how to draw stuff, you know, and I, uh, I hope that you've gathered that by now. If you've been watching with me every week and drawing with me, you know that, you know, I don't. I don't honestly care that much about drawing well. I care more about just the feelings and the insights that I get from drawing. It's not a technical exercise. It matters to me a great deal um, what I'm drawing. You know, I have emotional reactions to what I'm drawing, and that affects what I'm drawing. And one of the things that Annie Lamott says in this book is that the subject of writing really should begin with this, with your life, with the things that are around you and that matter to you. Um, you know, even if you're going to be a, a novelist, even if you're going to write fantasy, it still all comes out of your life and your experience. And that ultimately, as an artist, a lot of what we're doing is observing. We're in the business of observing the world around us and giving it some coherence, giving it some meaning and that is what we do, whether we're writing or drawing or, I don't know, many art forms. I mean, you, you could be a music composer. And again, you could be writing songs and pieces of music that are reflections of the realities that you see around you. What, and, you know, part of the job of, of a writer is to see how people behave, see how people interact, see how people, um, what they talk about how they talk, all these kinds of things are uh, are jobs as artists. So, And it doesn't mean that you have to have a terribly exciting life. You just have to have the life that you have, um, and that, that, the, that that life becomes a source for your art. Another thing that she talks about is the idea of authenticity and how important it is to be true and honest, and how that is really what... what um, what we appreciate, I think, from artists is that their insights are true, that they are relevant, um, and that they are honest. Because if things are too contrived or um, distant or withholding, if you're withholding information about how you feel, it comes out in your art, and your art will appear artificial, contrived, removed, uh, commercial perhaps, it will have it will not resonate with people. It will not sync with them. Um, Garrett, the pen that I'm using is a Winsor Newton Fineliner, an O5. It's a gray one. So, yeah. Um, so that's that's what she talks about. Is as an artist, we need to spend time um, just thinking about how we feel. 
and um, seeing how other people are living their lives. And that we, if we are writers and we're creating characters, that those characters ultimately need to come from our observation of actual people. So they pick up all those nuances. We're not, we're not creating out of whole cloth, but we are responding to our life experience. Another thing she talks about is the idea of, um, of making what she calls a shitty draft. So if you'll excuse my use of that word, but she uses that specific word to mean that she's the very first um, kind of work that she's doing, which she's writing, is just to get it out and not to assess it, not to judge it but just to make it and to get into the act of making. Um, And so it's all right to do something that's crappy at first because that's part of the process, the process of of just um, getting into making and starting the wheels turning and feeling free. Freedom is just a really important part of being an artist as well, is to feel that you are free to be you free to express yourself and what you see. And that internal critic that we have that is always looking at what we're doing and commenting on it, that, that critic is, um, is an obstacle that we have to get past and allowing ourselves to make a first draft that is designed not to be good. It's designed to just be free and expressive that freedom is really essential to making something authentic. And it's possible that, you know, the work that we make will remain bad. But it's more likely that by being free and free to make something that is crappy in the first place means that we are more likely to get to a place of of real beauty and truth Um, and so we go through a process of editing and refining and all that but that is all secondary to this initial kind of burst of creating uh, the raw material that comes out of our out of um, our honest and authentic experience and we can't censor ourselves there and i think this is all true of drawing i think I think the subject of our drawing should be things that come from our lives, that feel, that feel authentic to our experience, that have some meaning to us, and we should always be looking for that meaning. So, for instance, this book that we're drawing right now, it's a book that, you know, we're not doing this to have a drawing of a book. We're not doing it so that we can, you know, put a book drawing in our portfolios. That's not the point of this. It is to engage with the world and use our art to engage with the world and to understand better what we're experiencing, to make our lives richer and more pleasurable and more, you know, just beautiful in so many ways. And, um, you know, that's that's what this drawing allows us to do. And if we're creating something that's entirely fantasy all the time, we're not engaging with our actual reality, then we're losing that experience, that opportunity, right? If I'm just drawing, like, you know, spaceships and celebrities, Yes, I can do that, but I think, and and also I I think I can draw spaceships and celebrities that are somehow based in what matters to me, like why, you know, like the best science fiction is actually based in our present reality, right? Science fiction always reflects our times and our experience, even if it's fantastical, even if it seems to be about something that could never really be true, it is still the best fantasy based in reality. It is authentic. And if it's not, it's hard as a, as a reader to react, to relate to it. Cause you, I don't even know what that, what the person is even talking about. The, these characters just don't behave like anybody I've ever seen. I can't engage with them. I can't predict their, their response to stuff. It's just completely alien. Um, and the voice sounds wooden or the voice sounds mechanical. It doesn't sound like anything I'm familiar with. And so, you know, that's why 
even if you're going to go into the realm of fantasy, even if you're going to do drawings from your imagination, you're going to create cartoons, you're going to create characters of various kinds, you want to still start in this place of, of familiarity and authenticity, something that means something to you. Um, so yeah, those are, those are essential elements to making art. Another thing that she talks about is, um, another thing that she talks about is how publishing isn't the point of writing. I think this is a radical thought for a lot of writers. You mean, we're not just trying to get books published? She's saying, no, that's not the reason to write. The reason to write is because writing is a pleasure. And that, in fact, publication can rob you of that pleasure. Um, and that you'll find that, ultimately, if you're a published author, it's fine, it's nice, um, but that's not the point of it. You know, you might say to yourself, oh, I wish I could be a really famous author, and then I could just write all the time. I think her response to that would be, well, you can write a lot of the time now, even if you've never published anything. Um, you can still find the time, you can still get the pleasure, and that, in fact, the business of being a writer can in many ways uh, get in the way of that essential pleasure. Um, and I think that that's true of any art, that it has to begin with your passion for this art making. It has to begin there. You know, so if you love to draw, it's just because you love sitting down, just like you did when you were six or seven, sitting down at the kitchen table while your mom was cooking, and you have your box of crayons there, and you're just having fun, and you're making stuff. That's where it all begins. That's the whole point of it. If at some point somebody says, you know what, I want to pay you to do this, or I want to you know, s help you so that you don't have to do work for money that you don't like, great. That's a nice sort of sideline, but that's not the reason to do it. And so part of writing is, of course, having an audience. You want to make something that other people read and engage with, that your characters and your story comes alive because somebody else has experienced it, has shared it with you, or you've shared it with them. And that's great. That's fine. That, has, that doesn't mean that you need to become a published author, particularly in this day and age, you know? I mean, we um, have so many ways of sharing our creativity, our creative output, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to go and go through the gatekeepers of the publication world or the gatekeepers of the art world who will decide that you uh, are good enough to share your work. That has nothing to do with it. It might happen, uh, but nowadays we have so much freedom, so many platforms to share stuff on. I'm doing it with you right now. If you make a drawing today that you send and we are able to see it because you put the hashtag on it, it will be shared at the beginning of this next program. You don't need anybody else's assistance to do that besides, I guess, mine because I'm going to put it up there but but it's that's that's secondary right um here Mark says I've gotten a book on the ukulele published that I illustrated I get enough to buy a six pack every month it's going to cut back on your drinking maybe you need to write some more books if you want to get serious about drinking um but yeah I mean honestly I've published a dozen books I didn't do it to make huge amounts of money although as it happens I've made an enormous amounts of money from my books. Thankfully, most of them have been optioned by Hollywood. You've probably seen the creative license streaming on Netflix. Perhaps Everyday Matters came to a theater near you when you were a child. You'll always remember walking into the cinema, holding your mother's hand and saying, finally, Danny Gregory's classic has come to the golden screen. Yes, we'll never forget Meryl Streep playing my first fine liner back in the days Yes. So, yes. So I did it for different reasons. I did it entirely for pecuniary gain, but you don't need to. Don't be, don't be like me. Don't be driven by avarice. Do it for the love of it. You know, I'm doing this drawing of a book because 
uh, I plan to create a limited edition print that I will be selling uh, for several thousands of dollars through my gallery, uh, Gagosian, uh, and uh, some wise investors will be able to profit from it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm blathering. Um, I also noticed that this book has a very, very faint yellow checkerboard behind these letters. It's interesting. I don't think I've ever really paid attention to that before. Honestly, book covers, they're an interesting thing. I mean, I've designed a lot of book covers, and they're, they're hard. They're one of the hardest things about doing a book, honestly, is designing the cover, because the cover is basically an ad, an ad for your book, so that when you go into the bookstore, you see the ad for the book sitting on the shelf, and you go, oh, I'm interested in looking at that book because of that ad. So we absolutely judge books by their covers all the time. It's the only thing we can do in many cases. Um, and, of course, there's a whole language. God, this pencil is falling apart. There's a whole language of um, book cover design. You know, and there's so many. You, know, like you can immediately tell, like, what is a romance novel? What is a mystery novel? What is a biography? You can tell just by the the general type of design that they're using. <laughs> so, um, absolutely, books are judged by covers. Now, of course, we buy so many books on Amazon where you barely see the cover. So that is that is a different different kettle of fish. And similarly, if you buy it on the Kindle, I mean, there are many times that I'm reading a book I can't even remember what the name of the book is because it's... Yeah, it's like the name of the file on my Kindle. But what was that book? What's the name of this book again? Oh, that's right. <laughs> as much as anything, it's probably uh, yet another symptom of my uh, burgeoning senility. Yes. Um, all right. You know what? Let me read to you. While you're drawing, let me read to you. And I'm going to read to you from Bird by Bird. I marked a couple of sections here that I don't think were great. Because she talks about things like the inner critic. Like here. here In this section, she's talking about the voices in your head that echo as your work. And she says, close your eyes and get quiet for a minute until the chatter starts up. Then isolate one of the voices and imagine the person speaking as a mouse. Pick it up by the tail and drop it into a mason jar. Then isolate another voice. Pick it up by the tail, drop it in the jar, and so on. Drop in any high-maintenance parental units. Drop in any contractors, lawyers, colleagues, children, anyone who is whining in your head. Then put the lid on and watch all these mouse people clawing at the glass, jabbering away, trying to make you feel like shit because you won't do what they want, won't give them more money, won't be more successful, won't see them more often, then imagine that there's a volume control on the bottle. Turn it all the way up for a minute and listen to the stream of angry, neglected, guilt-mongering voices, and then turn it all the way down and watch the frantic mice lunge at the glass trying to get to you. Leave it down and get back to your shitty first draft. A writer friend of mine suggests opening the jar and shooting them all in the head, but I think he's a little angry, and I'm sure nothing like this would ever occur to you. So, I love that. And then here, this is... Some of you may relate to this. This is about perfectionism. Uh, perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor, the enemy of the people. It will keep you cramped and insane your whole life, and it is the main obstacle between you and a shitty first draft. I think perfectionism is based on the obsessive belief that if you run carefully enough, hitting each stepping stone just right, you won't have to die. The truth is that you will die anyway, and that a lot of people who aren't even looking at their feet are going to do a whole lot better than you and have a lot more fun while they're doing it. Besides, perfectionism will ruin your writing, blocking inventiveness and playfulness and life force. These are words we are allowed to use in California. Perfectionism means that you try desperately not to leave so much mess to clean up, but clutter and mess show up, show us that life is being lived. Clutter is wonderfully fertile ground. You can still discover new treasures under all those piles. Clean things up, edit things out, fix things, get a grip. Tidiness suggests that something is as good as it's going to get. 
Tidiness makes me think of held breath, of suspended animation, while writing needs to breathe and move. Obviously, similar stuff that we can say about write, about drawing, right? Um, and here she says, in any case, the bottom line is that if you want to write, you get to, but you probably won't be able to get very far if you don't start trying to get over your perfectionism. Uh, you set out to tell a story of some sort, to tell the truth as you feel it, because something is calling you to do so. It calls you like the beckoning finger of smoke in cartoons that rises off the pie, cooling on the windowsill, slides under doors and into mouse holes or into the nostrils of the sleeping man or woman in the easy chair. And then the aromatic smoke crooks its finger and the mouse or the man or woman rises and follows, nose in the air. But some days the smoke is faint and you just have to follow it as best you can, sniffing away. Still, even on those days, you might notice how great perseverance feels, and the next day the scent may seem stronger, or it may just be that you're developing a quiet doggedness. This is priceless. Perfectionism, on the other hand, will only drive you mad. Your day's work might turn out to have been a mess. So what? Vonnegut said, When I write, I feel like an armless, legless man with a crayon in his mouth. So I go ahead and make big scrawls and mistakes, use up lots of paper, Perfectionism is a mean, frozen form of idealism, while messes are the artist's true friends. What people somehow inadvertently, I'm sure, forget to mention when we were children was that we need to make messes in order to find out who we are and why we are here, and by extension, what we're supposed to be writing. So yes, there you have it. <laughs> I, just, I didn't mean to fade away like that. It's kind of hilarious, actually. Um, yes, so anyway, back to Bird by Bird, the book, the drawing. Bird by Bird, the drawing, coming soon to a theater near you. How's your book coming? Hey, I created a book today. I didn't think I need to maybe write another book. I haven't written a book. My last book was just kind of a disappointment. The process, not the book itself. I, I like the book. It was called How to Draw Without Talent. The process is a nightmare because my publisher, just as we were getting ready to go to the printer, went bankrupt. It never happened to me before. It happened to me and a lot of people who were publishing with, with this company. And then they were acquired by another company. They were acquired by, by Penguin Random House. You know, who was, you know, they brought out my book. I can't complain about that. They brought out my book. But, you know, they were the step parents. Penguin, my stepmother. They were, or or were they oh, they were the foster parents. No, they were the step parents. Not to make unfair comments about step parents, of which I've had many. Or foster parents, of which I haven't had any, but I think they they can be loving. But in this case, they were, you know, they did their job. They got pieces of paper and put ink on it. So anyway, um, <clears throat> that is what happened. So anyway, so I've, been, I've thought about it since. It's been it came out. Oh, that. Oh, and then not only did the publisher go bankrupt, but there was a pandemic. Yes, like a month after my book came out, there was a damn pandemic. I don't know if you heard about that, but yeah. And I bet you the first thought you had when the pandemic started was, oh my God, what about Danny Gregory's new book, How to Draw Without Talent? What's going to happen to it? Anyway, so yes, I wrote a book, book number 12, it was a less than positive experience. So I have thought since then, you know, stop going to other publishers and just publish your own damn book. I mean, it's very easy to publish an ebook these days. You know, publish a book that goes on the Kindle. I'm perfectly happy with that. But did everyone? No, they weren't. They weren't because they, yes, they were stuck at home. But they didn't buy my book to read because they didn't know about my book. Because 
I wasn't able to do publicity for it. I wasn't able to tour for it. And besides, every, nobody could be bothered. Nobody could be bothered to think about it. Nobody went to bookstores. It was a nightmare. Ivy, I was writing a story. My program deleted everything, and now I have to rewrite everything, and I'm very sad. That sounds like a nightmare. Back your stuff up. I'm backed up to a fairly well. I'm more backed up than a, than, I don't know, than a, than a, I'm backed up. I'm more backed up, than a, what was I going to say? A constipated pickup truck, dump truck. I'm backed up. I'm very backed up. I have, I'm backed up on the clouds. So if my house burns down, I'm backed up. Yes. 10,000 words gone. Okay. That's terrible. That is a nightmare. I can't, I be, I empathize with you big time. I lost a sketchbook on a plane once that I'd spent like two months filling. But I would say, maybe it's a blessing. Maybe it's time to start again. I've had that experience too. If you haven't lost heart, sometimes being forced into a clean slate can be a great thing. But I'm just trying to make lemonade out of your experience. <sighs> Italian NYC found my book in Mystic, Connecticut. Interesting. I wonder if it was How to Draw Without Talent. Um, yes. So it's tough being a writer. It's tough being an artist, but, you know, it's tough. Um, Garrett wants to be famous posthumously. I bet you Kafka and Van Gogh didn't want to be famous posthumously. But why not? Why not? Have hope. It could still happen. Um, Wilma, who is a li librarian. I, I love a librarian. Uh, books with gorgeous covers, of course. And particularly when a library book has a gorgeous cover because then it's also wrapped in that beautiful plastic wrap. Libraries are just the most amazing thing. We go to the library here all the time. I now have, for a while, I was bi-coastal. So I had a New York City library card and a Phoenix library card. And um, that, I felt like, I felt like a gunslinger. Like, I felt like, a gunslinger? Yeah, I felt like I had... But, I mean, I was just, I was so powerful and and wealthy having two library cards. And we would go to the library and I'd take out like stacks of books as, as usual. And then I found out I was just reading on my Kindle. And I felt bad about these physical books. So then I started buying books in the, you know, libraries have like a great shelf where you can buy books for a dollar. A lot of them are like really interesting, weird books. So I ended up just buying books and not taking them out, although my wife takes out huge stacks of cookbooks, obsessed about cookbooks. Okay. Um, we have, I don't know, we've been doing this for 41 minutes. Hopefully you've gotten your book done. Let me get out of here. Um, let me come back here. So every week... I share a sketchbook with you. It is brought to you by Windsor Newton. And this week, I didn't get it together to get somebody else's um, sketchbook for a tour. So I'm going to have to show you one of mine. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, so yes. Um, let's do it. Sorry, that's my, my animal out there. Excuse me for one second. While I, while I beat the, my beat my dog, um, Twiggy. All right, let's have a look here. This. So I'm going to just take you through this sketchbook, take you through it, and um, let me just shut this door though first. Hey, be quiet, please. No respect. Okay. Oh, shoot. Let me let's go back here. Let 
let me go back here a second. So what I did is, um, normally when I share a sketchbook in the sketchbook tour, it's like f three to four minutes long. But I started to worry that if I start look, showing you live an actual sketchbook of my own, I might just go blathering on forever. So what I've decided to do is I'm setting a timer for four minutes. Four minutes, and that's it. And once it's over, we're moving on. Okay? I'm talking to me, not to you, really. I'm yelling at me. I feel like I'm yelling a lot today, like I'm sort of like an AM DJ or some kind. Anyway, let's, let's go move on. Here we go. This is a sketchbook that is, um, you know, it's a travel sketchbook. I often have these kind of stickers and things like that here. This is listing some of the places that I went to when I was writing this book, writing the sketchbook. And also, um, I wrote down Any Human Heart, which is a book that I want to read, and, it, and did read, and loved, loved a lot, Any Human Heart. Um, yeah, so I was in Bangkok. This is a map of Bangkok. This is Bangkok in Thai, known as Krong Thap Maha Thakon. Anyway, uh, that was my bag. This was my sleeping medication that my doctor gave me, which I don't know if I ever took. Here's a map of where I went. And um, there's a Thai lady. And I saw, I went to this market and they had these bunnies that were dressed up. Oh my God, look, somebody wearing a mask. Can you see that? Somebody wearing a mask. Two teenage French kids were on the water taxi wearing these masks. How did their dad manage to convince them to wear them? Maybe they just watched the movie Contagion. So this is, this is long before the pandemic that I did that. Uh, this is like a, there was a guy who um, I paid three bucks and he did a drawing of me. There's that. And there are these beautiful boats that go up and down the, the river there in Bangkok. And this is um, a drawing of, of, a, of this giant, the biggest statue of the Buddha in the world, actually. And it's covered with gold. So I covered my drawing with gold leaf, which has been flaking off ever since. Uh, here's some, some gnome, non, non gnomes made of stone, Buddhas, uh, tak tak, which is one of the little kind of, uh, motorized rickshaws. This paper is very thick. Some lady or other, um, this is, oh, this is about getting a massage, getting a Thai massage. Incredibly cheap. Thailand, so of course you get a, get a massage all the time there. And a cup of coffee. Lots of different kinds of uniforms. Super paramilitary I wrote over here. Super paramilitary. Like all just kinds of guys in different kinds of uniforms and gear. Um, lots of beautiful architecture there. And stuff. Shoot, we've only got about a minute and a half. You can see the timer ticking down. We went to Thai boxing. Very cool. This is about driving, everybody driving around everywhere on motorcycles. I'm not sure why I did it upside down, but I did. There he is, the king of Thailand, the king of Siam, which is what Thailand was known as. I wrote, not Yul Brynner. King and I remember that, of course. That's my wife's hippo. Uh, artichoke. Olive tree. Uh, this is a kitchen at a place that I was teaching a workshop, Row, Massachusetts. This is just various drawings of stuff there, around here. Yeah, some of this is gouache. Some of it is um, Dr. P.H. Martin's beautiful transparent watercolor things. This is more in Row. Some sheep at uh, the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. A bunch of crabs in Maryland, too. This is in San Francisco. Yeah, I was traveling like insane amounts at that time. And this is also in San Francisco. This is waiting for another plane. Um, drawing people waiting for a plane. There's Philip Glass. Oh no, what happened? <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Should I go back? I can go back. I'm cheating. But I got I, I want to show you some more of this. You don't mind, do you? Tell me if you're bored, and I can just stop it. But that's Philip Glass. 
Um, I did a piece of music with Philip Glass. He was a plumber, you know. Philip Glass was the plumber for lots of um, lots of artists in the '60s, basically, and early '70s in Soho. He was the guy who helped them to uh, fix their lofts up. Anyway, I did a commercial with him, and he did a piece of music for me. That was my old dog Joe. He's a camera drawing money for some reason. Who's this John Curran, the artist? And uh, this is more this workshop. Various other things around the workshop. And uh, it's like a self-portrait of me as a monkey, I think. <laughs> uh, yes, I was drawing. I was drawing monkeys. This is like the monkey in my head. That this it says. This one is too cute. This one is not smart enough and too vicious to be convincing. So. Oh, yes, I went to Tokyo. I had to do a presentation to Honda. And I went to Tokyo round trip 39 hours. Yeah, that was insane. And, uh, yeah. I started drawing with this brush pen at, at a time that I was not into drawing with brush pens. And I just started hating brush pens. And then I hated this, started to hate this thing. This is about my schedule. Yeah, so I stopped. I stopped at that point. I needed, I needed that extra minute and a half. <laughs> um, let me take a breath. I've been talking an awful lot, quickly and loudly. Allie says, do I write with a dip pen in my sketchbooks in situ when drawing from life? Um, I write with a dip pen in a lot of my sketchbooks. It depends. This particular book, yeah, I wrote with a dip pen a fair amount in it. Um, so, yeah, I write I, in, in situ. Yeah, sort of. Depends. I mean, I just write when I have it. If if I'm not anywhere near dip pens, sometimes I'll write in it later on, but generally, no. It's, it's hard carrying a dip pen and a bottle of ink around with you, of course. So I've, I've tried dealing with that at various points, but not terribly successfully. Um, this paper. Okay, so this paper, this is a sketchbook that, that my friend Roz made for me. And this is gorgeous paper. Um, it is called Gutenberg. No, it's called Arches 90 Pound. Is it or is that the cover? Yeah, no, it's it's Arches ninety pound. It's it's basically it's very soft. It's like printmaking paper. So there's that. Um, all right. Well, I, I'm just going through your comments and seeing if there's anything else you wanted me to address. What pen do I write with when I'm on a plane and I don't have a dip pen? Whatever pen I have at hand. You know, I mean, I like writing with a dip pen because I like the, the I like two things about it. I like the look of it. I like what it looks like because it allows me to make thin and thick lines. Another thing I like about a dip pen is you pause to re-dip, to refill your ink. And that's an interesting thing to do when you're drawing and writing, I mean, because you, you're pausing to think for one second. You know, it's not <sighs> streaming out of you. It's like, you know, it's like taking a breath. You write, <gasps> refill your ink, take it under breath. Um, you know, but I, I don't have to do it that way. It's just a way of doing it. So yes, um, where did I do the sketches? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, darkness from Azerbaijan. Darkness from Azerbaijan. Available now. I think I'm working on my uh, my movie trailer voiceover effect. In a world where darkness comes from Azerbaijan, dip pens spill prodigiously over plane seats. Sorry. Um, yes. All right. Let's stop. Let us stop.
It is 10.53 here in uh, Mountain Time, Phoenix, Arizona. The temperature, by the way, is, you notice I'm wearing a sweater, it's 63 degrees. That's unreasonable. I know some of you have snow where you are, but seriously, 63 degrees in Phoenix? It is not on. But this is the reality. Which this is this is the the torture. This is the suffering that I'm I'm uh, forced to endure. Where can you get an SBS mug? I don't know if you can get them anymore. We should make some more. I think we were making them, and then we were sort of shipping them to people. Sometimes it was kind of a pain. We have a couple, and sometimes we'll send them out to people. So um, I'll make more of an effort to do that kind of a thing. Oh wait, there's oh you can get them from Zazzle. Oh there you go. Okay. I did, I, it's been a long time since I did that. How long have I been sketching? You mean today? I started sketching about half an hour ago. Um, not from, I'm not happy with the word sketching. It's not, it's not a word I like. Sketching. I like drawing, but I find I'm troubled by the word sketching. Sketching feels like, it feels scratchy. Maybe because sketch and scratch, similar words, sketchy. Like scratching out a living, scratching a mosquito bite, sketching, scratching, drawing feels to me more what I do. Because sketching also feels like sketchy, 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 scratchy, scratchy, scratchy. I prefer to just draw. I started to draw uh, in my late 30s. Oh, that was like 280 years ago. But yes, I was a, a full grown ass man, as they say, when I started to draw. Yes. So drawing, uh, I know what you mean, Stella, and I'm sorry, I just went off on a weird tangent at your expense. So, um, so yes, I started in, yeah, 25 years ago. But honestly, I wasn't much better 25 years ago. I mean, I wasn't much worse 25 years ago than I am now. I haven't really made enormous progress in terms of the drawing that I do. It's kind of sort of pretty much similar. So the fact that I've been doing it for so long isn't necessarily an indication that you need to draw for as long as I've been to draw well. <sighs> drawing. Yes. Drawing. Dra uh, I often have wrong because I say drawing and people say, dr like they dr I have to say drying. Drying, like if I if I'm trying to transcribe something, like to speak to my computer and have it dictate, you know, dictate to my computer, have it write it down. I see, drawing it has no idea what I'm saying. It thinks I'm saying drawing, whatever. Um, if he says I never say I'm drawing because it feels like that means whatever I'm doing is complete. Possibly, I say, I know what you mean. It, sketching this is like a good excuse. Like, I wasn't serious. I was only sketching. It's like a sketch, you know. It's just a sketch. Maybe that's the problem. It's like, why not do a drawing? Just slow down, use a decent pen, and do a drawing. Honestly, that's another thing that Annie Lamont says in this book that probably is the most important thing, and I've kind of forgotten to mention it until now. She says that if you want to be a writer, and I think it's absolutely as true of being an artist, being somebody who draws... You just have to do it. And if you do it, most that writers generally don't think a lot about whether they can write. They just write. They may not write well all the time, particularly when they're starting out. But if you do it on a regular basis, on the reg, keep drawing or keep writing, just do it on a regular basis. And again, allow yourself that shitty first draft. I keep worrying every time I say shitty that there's like people out there who are going to say, yeah, I used to watch the Danny Gregory, but then he started like cursing all the time. Just so you know, I am generally much less circumspect, but I feel like I'm in public, so I have to be careful. Anyway, doing it on a regular basis helps you to develop into a habit, helps you to develop confidence, helps you to get control. That's, those are the keys to drawing well is to just do it often enough that you feel like it's second nature. Going back to what she was saying about authenticity, right? Feeling authentic about what you're doing, that is coming from who you are. You, do, you should never feel bad about that. You should never feel bad about who you are, 
how you see the world, how you express yourself. Those are the essential things that we do as human beings. It's really important that you feel okay about that. And it may not be that you're expressing yourself or drawing or sketching or writing or playing the vibraphone the way that you think you ultimately should, but so what? It's a journey. It's a journey that you can only make progress on if you take that first step and then the second step and so on. You have to do this on a regular basis. So for all of you who are watching this and saying, easy for you to say, you draw well, I just draw quite a lot. I just write quite a lot. It's nothing more than that. And you're absolutely capable of doing the same thing. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to do anything dramatic. You just have to allow yourself to do it. Because if you allow yourself to do it, then it's fun to do. If you're constantly battling with yourself and critiquing yourself and arguing with yourself and beating yourself up, it's not fun and you don't want to do it. So don't. That's your choice. You have the control over that part of it, which is how you react in this relationship that you have with yourself. Are you going to be a bad partner to yourself or a good supportive one? It's entirely up to you. you know. But if you want to have this, if you want to have fun doing this and you want to enjoy it and you want to be proud of it and you want to see where it will take you, then you have to be supportive of yourself. That is what Annie Lamont said. That's what I say too. Jan says practice, practice, practice. I think that's true. Although for me, it isn't actually practice. No more than it's like the practice in the yogic sense of yoga that you practice when you do yoga. To me, it's because practice also implies exercises and all that kind of stuff. I think just draw a lot. Just draw everything. Do like, be like Annie Lamott. Walk around with a notebook and a sketchbook. Just draw stuff, all kinds of stuff. You saw from my sketchbook what I was drawing. Suitcases, cops, cups of coffee, whatever. That's how you do it. All right. Thanks a lot. We've now gone massively over time. I was trying to be incredibly organized about this, but... My wife's out of the house right now, so I can do whatever I want. She often says to me, <clears throat> let's wrap it up. But uh, shh, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. So I'm going to stop now because I want to. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Um, and in four, it's going to be an hour, two, one. Bye.